Unit 2, Recording 9. A. It's Karen Goodman, isn't it? Uh, yes. Hello, Karen. Pleased to meet you. My name's Michael Harrison. Come and sit down. Oh, thank you. So, uh, thank you for applying for the job and coming to the interview today. First, I'd like to ask you about your experience. In your letter, you say you've worked in an office before. Uh, tell me about that. Oh, well, it was ages ago, actually. OK. Well, um, what did you do there? Nothing much, really. I was just an assistant, you know, answering the phone and stuff. B. Ah, there you are. Oh, dear. I'm so sorry. Let's see. You are Jenny, aren't you? Uh, Jenny Scott? <sighs> yes, that's right. Well, come in, Jenny. I'm Peter Manning, head of the economics department, and I'll be interviewing you today. Very nice to see you. Thank you for coming. I'm really very sorry. I, I, I thought it would be a much quicker journey. The traffic was terrible, and oh, then I couldn't find the building. OK, um... Can I start then by asking you about your reasons for applying for the course? What do you think you'd get from studying economics in this particular university, Jenny? C. Uh, OK, let, let's move on, Liz. You've talked about your experience to date. Now I'd like to know about your plans for the future. What are your plans for the future, let's say for the five years following the course? Oh, um, well... I'd really like to do this and then maybe stay in the same business for a while when I finish my degree. Um, I'm not really sure what I want to do after that, really. I mean, I'd love to study here. I think I'd get a lot out of it as well as having a lot to offer. But um, after that, well, I don't know at the moment. I haven't really thought about that. Do you see catering as a long-term thing in your life or just for the short term? Um, I'm just thinking short term at the moment. I really haven't thought about the future. I don't know how I'm going to feel. I suppose I should think a bit further ahead, but... D. Well, thank you very much for talking to me today, Linda. We're coming to the end of the interview now. Is there anything that you'd like to ask me? Yes, I do have a question, if that's OK. Of course. Fire away. Well, I was wondering about promotion prospects. Obviously, I'm keen on staying in the journalism business, and I'd like to know what kind of opportunities there might be. That's a good question. We're very interested in the professional development of our staff and offer many opportunities for further training and promotion within the company. The right person can be promoted to a position such as senior editor, and we're always looking for people to manage completely new magazines. Anything else? Could you tell me when you're going to make your decision? I've got some other candidates who I'll be interviewing this afternoon, but we'll let you know by tomorrow afternoon. Thank you very much. Unit 2, Recording 10 1 Thank you for applying for the job and coming to the interview today. 2. I'd like to ask you about your experience. 3. You say you've worked in an office before. Tell me about that. 4. I'm Peter Manning and I'll be interviewing you today. 5. Can I start by asking you about your reasons for applying for the course? 6. What are your plans for the future? 7. Is there anything that you'd like to ask me? Unit 3. Old or new? Recording 1. Until the 3rd century BC, Carthage had been a powerful city which controlled most of the Mediterranean Sea. For the previous few hundred years, the Carthaginians had been trading with people in India and the Mediterranean area. There had been many battles between the Romans and the Carthaginians to try to control the area. 
Although Carthage had taken control of many important places, they hadn't managed to take Sicily, the island on their doorstep. So when the Romans won total control of Sicily, Carthage decided to attack Rome. The leader of the attack was a brilliant young general called Hannibal. He had 40 war elephants trained to charge at the enemy. As Hannibal's army was marching northwards towards the Alps, soldiers from Spain and other areas joined them. The icy mountains were difficult to cross, however, and by the time they reached Italy in 218 BC, many of his soldiers and elephants had died. They famously won three battles, but in the end the Romans were stronger, and they took the city of Carthage. Unit 3, Recording 2 Leather Porcelain Denim Bronze Silk Iron Lycra Wool Gold Rubber Cotton Silver Unit 3 Recording 3 1 It's really cold today, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want to borrow my jumper? Well, I don't think I will, thanks. Trouble is, I can't wear wool because it makes my skin itchy. Oh dear, does it? Well, I've got a cotton jacket in the back of my car. Two. Hey, I like your jeans. Thanks. They're nice, aren't they? I bought them yesterday. They really suit you. <laughs> I think the denim's got lycra in it, so they feel quite stretchy and very comfortable. Three. Oh, what's the matter? Oh, it's a real pain. I got these lovely earrings for my birthday, but I think I'm allergic to them. Look, my ears have gone red and sore. Oh, yes. They look really painful. You mustn't wear them. No, I think I can only wear real gold or silver jewellery. They seem to be OK. Four. I bought my nephew a really nice toy train made of wood for his birthday, but I don't think he ever plays with it. Oh, really? Why not? Oh, I don't know. I love wooden toys, but I think most kids prefer plastic ones. You know, the adults like wood, but the children want plastic. <laughs> or better still, computer games. Five. You know my friend Sylvia? She's a vegetarian. Uh, oh, yes. I met her at your party, I think. Yes, that's right. Well, she was telling me, obviously she doesn't agree with eating animals, but she also won't wear animal products. Oh, right. No fur coats, then. <laughs> no, certainly not fur. But she won't use anything made of leather, either. Shoes, bags, coats, nothing. Unit 3, Recording 4 Hello. Welcome to today's edition of Then and Now. Today we're talking about an incredible country with a fascinating culture and a long history going back over 3,000 years. China is hugely rich in art and culture and its food and traditions are well known around the world. But two aspects of China are perhaps lesser known. Firstly, this vast country has a long history of inventing things and secondly, in recent years, has started to flourish as an important global economy with ultra-modern cities and many booming industries. Today we've got China expert Sandra Benning here to tell us all about this flourishing land of invention. Hello, Sandra. Hello. Well, uh, this programme is called Then and Now, so let's start with then. China's history and this idea of a land of invention... I knew that the Chinese invented paper, but I must admit, I didn't know that they invented so many other important things. Before we talk about those, can you remind us about the story of paper? Yes, it was in 105 AD that papermaking was perfected in China. The first paper was made of silk, 
Well, it was really the waste from silk making, which they pulped up to make paper. Of course, paper had an enormous impact on China, didn't it? Yes, with paper and then printing, it meant people could get information much more easily. Hmm. So, what else did the Chinese invent? Well, quite a few simple but important things. I think one of the simplest inventions was the wheelbarrow, invented around 220 AD, which meant that enormous loads could be carried by just one person, as well as other things that we take for granted today, like silk, porcelain, the kite, and even the umbrella. Oh, <laughs> And we have the Chinese to thank for fireworks, don't we? Yes, that's right. In the 8th century, the Chinese discovered gunpowder. And by the 10th century, it was being used to make fireworks, the gun, the rocket and the bomb. So it eventually had a huge influence on the whole world, of course. Another major invention was a machine for making cast iron, which they first developed in the 6th century BC. Wow, that really is a long time ago. Mm. That must have made a big difference to people's lives too. That's right. A lot of iron was used for agricultural tools, so production was increased hugely, which brings me quite nicely to the present, really, to the now, to present-day China. Is agricultural production big in China now? Well, yes, there's a lot of agriculture. About 15% of the economy is based on agriculture. You know, things like rice, tea, cotton and fish. But it's certainly not just countryside and agriculture. There are some huge modern cities like Shanghai. And industry is huge in China now and expanding all the time. Production of iron is growing at a rate of about 22% a year in China at the moment. That's certainly a booming industry. So what other industries are important in China now? Well, so many of the things we buy are made in China, aren't they? Industrial production accounts for over half of China's economic wealth, including such consumer items as toys, clothes, shoes, cars and electronic goods, as well as the heavier industrial products like iron. Unit 3, Recording 5 So, what do you think? Well, I think the first one is easy. I mean, we have to decide on the three most important inventions ever. So, for the first one, do you agree that the computer is definitely the most important? Well, maybe. But isn't it true that we wouldn't have computers without electricity? So, really, I think that the invention of the light bulb and discovering electricity is incredibly important. What about you? Hmm, I suppose you're right. How do you feel about the television, then? It's similar to the computer, really. I mean, again, we wouldn't have the television without electricity, would we? OK. So, shall we decide on the light bulb for the first one? Yes, fine. And what else do you think is important? Let's look at the next thing. Unit 3, Recording 6 1. Involvement Arrangement Production Replacement 2. Friendship Partnership, membership, enjoyment. Three. Brotherhood, employment, manhood, neighbourhood. Four. Typewriter, pianist, physicist, scientist. Five. Forgetfulness, readiness, forgiveness, modernity. Six. Alteration, donation, development, admission. Unit three, 
Recording 7. 1. Career development is very important to me. 2. Good communication is essential in a successful relationship. 3. There is a lot of pollution in my neighbourhood. 4. One of my biggest weaknesses is forgetfulness. 5. I think scientists should be paid more than musicians. 6. My longest and most important friendship started in my childhood. Unit 3, recording 8. Hi, Martin. How's it going? Oh, hi.、Uh, yeah, I'm fine, but a bit tired, you know. Oh, are you very busy at the moment? Well, yes.、Uh, didn't I tell you I'm doing a course?、Uh, mostly online and also one day a week in college. Oh, it's really hard work. No, I didn't know. What is it?、Uh, it's a long story, but what I'm doing is trying to get a basic qualification in maths. Maths? But <laughs> I thought you hated maths. Well, yes, it was definitely my worst subject at school. I really hated it then. I had an awful teacher and I didn't understand a thing. So, why do you want to do it now? I don't want to, but I need to.、Oh, looking back, I wish I'd studied harder at school and just done it because I really need it now. I want to retrain to be a teacher. A maths teacher? <laughs> no, I want to be a history teacher, but in the UK you have to have a basic maths qualification to train to be any kind of teacher. Really? That doesn't seem fair. Well, that's the rules. Now I'm older and、uh, wiser, I realise that studying hard and passing exams gives you more choice in life. That's one of the biggest lessons I've learned.、Mm, oh, I suppose you're right. But well, it's only with the benefit of hindsight that you realise these things. When you're young, you often can't see the point of some things. I mean, it is difficult to see the point of it, really. How were you to know that doing well in maths then would help you become a history teacher now? <laughs> I know. Unit 4 Risk. Recording 1. I'm very different to my brother, I think. I'm not very good at taking risks, whereas he loves it. The maddest thing I think he's done was just after he finished university. He and a friend decided to go by motorbike from the top of Africa to the bottom. For years, it had been a kind of obsession with him, something he just had to do. And he did it. I mean, it wasn't all plain sailing, but they made it in one piece and had some amazing adventures along the way. I do think he's incredibly brave. Actually, I've just been offered a chance to be part of a sailing expedition to the Galapagos Islands. I've always had a dream of doing something like this, but never thought it might really happen. It will mean giving up my job, and I'm not sure what I'll do when I get back, but I'm sure it would be an amazing experience. Unit 4, recording 2. And now here's one for all of you in offices working at desks or computers. Basically, it relieves tension in the neck, back, and shoulders, and it also increases lung capacity. First, place your fingertips on your shoulders with elbows bent in front of you. Then breathe in deeply. Now, while breathing out, drop your chin onto your chest. And bring your elbows together in front of your body. Finally, while breathing out, lift your head up and back, drawing your elbows back as though they want to touch behind your back. Repeat this ten times. Unit 4. Recording three. One of the best things we did on holiday was to go whitewater rafting. However, I was a bit nervous at first when they told us we had to sign something which basically said we wouldn't hold the company responsible if we got injured.
or died. Anyway, the guy in charge of our boat gave us some instruction before we started off. We had to wear life jackets, of course, but I was quite surprised that we didn't have to wear any kind of crash helmet. We were also supposed to wear trainers, but I'd forgotten mine, so I had to wear my sandals. Finally, we got going and the whole thing was fantastic. There were eight of us in a boat, and there really was a lot of white water. It was a bit like being on a roller coaster, and I nearly fell in at one point. The one thing I'm sorry about is that I didn't get any photos. I should have taken my camera, but I was afraid I would drop it in the water. Unit 4, Recording 4 So, did you go and see it in the end? Yeah, yeah, I said I would, didn't I? You often say you'll do things, but... OK, OK, <laughs> well, this time I did. And? You were right, it was pretty good. Pretty good? Come on, it was much, much better than that. I think it's the film which I've enjoyed most this year. Really? I do like Clint Eastwood, but I suppose I've never really been that into films about boxing. OK, but it's not really about boxing, is it? Isn't it? I mean, one of the main characters runs a boxing gym and the other wants to be a boxing champion. <sighs> That's all true, but there's a lot more to it than that. There are so many different themes running through the film. Such as? Well, risk, for one. What do you mean? Well, you know at the beginning of the film, one of Clint Eastwood's most promising boxers leaves him just as he has a chance to make the big time. Oh, yes, that's right. Doesn't he go off with another promoter or something? Yeah, after years of training in the gym with the Clint Eastwood character. And actually, it's because Clint won't take a risk with him. He won't put him up for a big championship fight, and the other promoter will. Exactly. The Clint character plays safe. He's just too cautious. And then this young woman, Hopeful, turns up. She'd been working in a cafe before she went to the gym, but dreaming of being a champion boxer. But I thought he didn't want to take her on because she was a woman, or a girly, as he puts it. Not because it was a risk. Well, at first, yes. But when she actually turns out to be really good, then he faces another risk. You mean he'll train her up and then she'll leave him? Exactly. And that nearly does happen, doesn't it? Oh, yes, that's right. But she sticks with Clint in the end, thank goodness. Then there's a kind of emotional risk he takes, too. You mean about getting too involved with her? Well, yes. You remember how he keeps writing to his daughter and never getting any replies? Yes. I never worked out what that was all about. I mean, there's obviously some story, something has happened, which we never really find out about. Yes. Well, in the film... I think there's a growing emotional connection between them. And given what happened with his daughter, that's a big risk he's taking too. Mm, I see what you mean. I hadn't really looked at it like that before, but now you say it... I mean, obviously, there's lots of other stuff too. Weren't you shocked by what happened in her big championship fight? Oh, wow, yes. I couldn't believe it. Unit 4, Recording 5. 1. She had always wanted this job. 2. I went and saw my doctor yesterday. 3. I decided to ask if I could borrow his new Mercedes. 4. She really doesn't like the words to their new song. 5. He wants to study sociology or psychology at university. 6. He broke the kitchen window while he was playing with a ball. Unit 4, Recording 6 1. It was this job that she had always wanted. 2. It was yesterday that I went and saw my doctor. 3. It was his new Mercedes that I decided to ask if I could borrow. 4. It is the words to their new song that she really doesn't like. 5. It's sociology or psychology that he wants to study at university. 6. It was the kitchen window that he broke while he was playing with a ball. Unit 4, Recording 7 Well, 
Obviously, both photos are of someone doing the same thing, but in very different situations. I guess the first guy is one of those people who's really into risk-taking, you know, extreme sports and stuff. Not like the second guy. So, they're both ironing. In the first picture, I can see a young man ironing some kind of brown T-shirt or sweatshirt or something. But the ironing board is somehow fixed between the sides of a ravine. I can't imagine how he got there with the ironing board and how he manages to stay there himself. It's amazing. On the other hand, the second picture is of a much more ordinary situation. A middle-aged man is doing the ironing in his kitchen. His wife might be out at work. He's also looking after his children, but not very well. Strangely, the guy in the first picture looks more relaxed than the man in the second picture, even though it must be very dangerous. Maybe it's because he doesn't have so much ironing to do, and he doesn't have to look after any children. I know I hate ironing, but I'm also scared of heights and climbing, so I wouldn't like to be in either situation. Unit 4, Recording 8 Long Length Lengthen Short Shorten Wide Width Widen Broad Breadth Broaden High Height Heighten Deep Depth Deepen Low Lower Unit 5. The Past. Recording 1. 1. I get quite nostalgic when I see some of the old TV ads that I used to watch as a child. 2. Do you remember when we all went to the seaside on holiday? The weather was always terrible, but we had a great time. You always used to bring back a souvenir. 3. So, remind me, which company did you work for back then? 4. I've got such a terrible memory. When did we go to that music festival? It must have been in the 70s sometime, I think. 5. I think what made it so memorable was the little song that used to go with it. 6. My mother is getting quite forgetful these days, but she likes to reminisce about the family holidays we had when we were children. Unit 5, Recording 2 Oh, <laughs> I'd forgotten about this photo. Gosh, this brings back a few memories. Really? <laughs> so who's this? It's not your mum, is it? And, and where is it? Is that when you lived in South London? Yes, that's right. Ah. And that's where my parents lived for years and where I was brought up. It was this huge, rambling old house. Actually, we just uh, rented one floor of it, but a lot of the rest of it was just empty. And we had this enormous garden pretty much to ourselves. So is that you in the garden? <sighs> yep. <laughs> Haven't changed a bit, have I? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually Muriel I'm with. I've told you about her, haven't I? Um, maybe. Remind me. Well, basically, my mum wasn't very well after I was born, and so she employed Muriel to come in and look after me a lot of the day. She was a trained children's nanny. Ah. The idea was that she'd just be around for a few months, but in the end she stayed until I was nearly seven. She was really important to me, and I'm still in touch with her and her family. Wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I think this is one of my favourite photos of all. She was an amazing person, and partly because of her, I have really great memories of my childhood. Aww. I mean, she was really good fun. We were always doing interesting things, but at the same time, you couldn't mess around with her. When she told you to do something, you did it. No arguing. Uh, that was for sure. <laughs> she sounds great.
So what kind of child were you? I bet you were naughty. Me? No! <laughs> <laughs> I was a model child. Actually, uh, I did a lot of things very quickly for my age. Like what? Well, my mum tells me I said my first few words by the time I was nine months and I was able to walk more or less by ten months. Gosh. Then later, I was quite musical. I could play simple tunes on the piano reasonably well by the age of four, which apparently is quite early. So where did it all go wrong? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Shame, really. <laughs> Unit 5, Recording 3 My brother Clive and I were always pretty competitive, even as quite young children. I remember we both got bikes one Christmas and he could ride his on his own before me. I was really cross. He was only five, I think. Swimming was good, though. He's always been quite nervous about being in the water, but I've always loved it. I was able to swim well by the age of eight, but even now he's quite tentative. I mean, he can swim, but he doesn't really like it. What else? Oh, yes. Our grandad was a great chess player, so we got into that at one point. I think we were about 13 or 14. Anyway, I was really good at it. So good, in fact, that he never managed to beat me, not even once. Oh, he hated that and said he'd never play me again. And he never did. More recently, we've taken up skiing. Clive loves it and he's great at it, a real natural I'm OK. I mean, I'm improving. In fact, last time I succeeded in coming down my first black slope without falling over, which I was really proud of. Unit 5, Recording 4 And I think this photo must have been taken a few years later. So who are all these people? You're in both the photos, though, aren't you? <laughs> In this one, it's you on the ground with the dogs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, as usual. <laughs> and on the left is my father, then my mum. At the far right is Aunt Joan. She was my father's older sister. And next to her, her husband, Uncle Jack. This photo is actually taken outside the hotel that my aunt and uncle had, down in the southwest of England. We used to go and stay with them in the summer quite often. So did you like being down there? Oh, the hotel was great. As a kid, I found it really exciting. Usually in the summer, at home, I'd get quite bored. There wasn't much to do, whereas at the hotel, there was no end of possibilities. I used to go around everywhere exploring. Uh, they had tennis courts and a wood at the back. And sometimes, I remember I'd go in the kitchens and the chef would let me try some of the desserts. That was until I ate so much of the chocolate mousse one time that I threw up. <laughs> <laughs> But no, uh, overall, it, it was brilliant. Much more fun than just hanging around at home. And how did you get on with the dogs? Oh, they were a lot of fun. Sammy, my cat, you know, in this picture, uh -huh. he was just so, uh, how can I put it, uh, superior and independent. <laughs> like all Siamese cats, probably. And he wasn't very interested in kids, I don't think. On the other hand, these two dogs were just so friendly. I think they just liked the attention. But they became like my best friends. They used to come exploring with me. I was always really sad to leave them when we had to go home. Unit 5, Recording 5 1. This year hasn't been great, but I'm sure things will be better next year. 2. I saw this great film last night. Oh, yeah. Three. But I don't really understand what you're saying. Do you mean that I won't be able to turn the computer on when I do that? Four. Kate? Kate! Thank goodness you're home. I've been so worried. Five. Listen, I think we're lost. And we shouldn't be walking around here late at night. I'm not sure that it's safe, you know. Six. So, go on. Why exactly did you agree to go out on a date with him? Seven. 
Well, of course, he said that's why he was late home, but you don't believe him, do you? Eight. I can't believe it. We're flying off to Australia for a month on Monday to see my twin sister. Oh, I can't wait. Nine. You're always late. Why can't you be on time for once in your life? Ten. Can you see that young guy standing, looking into that car? What on earth do you think he's doing? Eleven. She said what? I can't believe it. That's terrible. Unit five, recording six. Well, where shall I start? Well. The basic story is that a girl, Catherine, is left a box by her mother who died when she was a baby. Catherine discovers the box when she's 31, the same age as when her mother died. Inside the box are 11 objects, like a red hat, a map of part of England, and so on. All of them meaningless at first, but when Catherine begins to examine each object, she finds new truths not only about her mother, but also about herself. Through these objects, Catherine finds that her mother was not the sweet and innocent woman that everyone likes to remember her as. So, what did I think of it? Well, overall, I really enjoyed it. It's a really interesting idea for a story. And I thought it was very well written. Not only that, but there are lots of aspects of Catherine's life that I can totally relate to. Um, different events, feelings and thoughts which so accurately mirror my own life that I found myself constantly underlining parts of the text. However, sometimes I found it a bit slow. I wanted to know about the objects, and it seemed to take ages to work out what they were all about. Still, apart from that one small thing, it was very easy to read, and I'd certainly recommend it. Unit 5 Recording 7. Well, first of all, it's very important to make sure that your time capsule container is going to last for a very long time, obviously. So it mustn't rust, it mustn't leak, and it must be very hard-wearing. We were told to avoid any kinds of plastics and go for material like aluminium or stainless steel. We put in various books, newspapers and photographs all of which I still think were a good idea. With books and papers, it's important to make sure they're printed on the highest quality paper so they don't deteriorate any faster than absolutely necessary. One mistake we made was to put in colour photographs. I mean, photographs are very good information carriers across time and cultures, but apparently black and white photographs are much more stable and long-lasting than colour prints, so that's something worth bearing in mind. The other thing which we should have thought about was that some kinds of technology become redundant. We put in an old videotape, and they probably won't be able to view that when the capsule finally gets opened. So it's probably best not to include any items that require any technology or equipment to use other than eye and hand. Finally, and again pretty obviously I guess, do make sure that the outside of the capsule is clearly labelled using a permanent marker pen, saying what it is and any necessary instructions.